Tornadoes are one of Mother Nature's most extraordinary phenomena. With a diameter of over 3,000 meters, they can leave a trail of destruction covering areas greater than 300 kilometers, or nearly the distance of a plane journey from New York to Washington, DC. With eyewitness accounts and fascinating expert insights, we investigate an area in the United States known as Tornado Alley, and take a look at a terrifying day in May 2011 when the small town of Joplin, Missouri was ravaged by one of the deadliest tornadoes to ever strike America. By the nature of its extraordinary structure, a tornado can rip through a district, completely destroying one house while leaving its neighbor virtually unscathed, making it one of Mother Nature's most mercurial killers. Tornadoes are nature's most violent storms. Spawned from powerful thunderstorms, they can cause fatalities and devastate neighborhoods within minutes. They are vertical funnels of violently spinning air, extending from a thunderstorm right down to the ground. Their winds can reach over 400 kilometers per hour and can clear a highly destructive pathway. Some tornadoes are clearly visible, while rain or low-lying clouds hide others. They can develop so quickly that there is little, if any, advanced warning. Before a tornado hits, the wind may die down and the air becomes still. Sometimes, all you are able to see to determine its location is a cloud of debris whirling above the ground. Tornadoes usually form near the far side of a thunderstorm and are often accompanied by falling rain and hail. But as violent as these driving forces may be, they can sometimes bring with them clear skies and sunshine. The most destructive tornadoes spawn from giant, persistent thunderstorms called supercells. So a supercell is uh, a rotating thunderstorm, so it's a special kind of storm. We don't often get them here in the UK. Um, but in parts of the world like the United States, this is what you hear about the most. Big land masses, you get the conditions necessary to produce these massive rotating storms that produce really big hailstones, really heavy rain, strong winds, and then tornadoes. The magnitude of these twisters can be seen in the infamous Tri-State Tornado, considered the deadliest tornado in US history. On the 18th of March, 1925, this tornado struck Illinois, Indiana, and Missouri. During a terrifying three and a half hours, it punched a path over 468 kilometers long, leaving 695 dead and over 2,000 injured. It struck 13 counties and resulted in a total of $16.5 million worth of damage, roughly the equivalent of $230 million today. Tornadoes frequently affect various regions of America, making it appear as if this natural phenomenon is unique to that part of the world. But the number of countries where these deadly forces have been reported is immense, ranging across the globe from India to Argentina. South Africa to Australia. Even England is not immune to this freak weather phenomenon. It's just absolutely amazing. Can't believe it. And I've heard since that there's a lot of other households been affected. Traditionally, this country is thought of as a land of gently rolling countryside, where a few inches of rain can be a major talking point. But a surprising study in 2015 showed that England has more tornadoes per square kilometer than anywhere else in the world. And that includes America's notorious Tornado Alley. One of the interesting aspects of tornadoes in the United Kingdom is that they occur year round. 
So in the United States, we have a very distinct seasonality. So it's really during the spring and, and again, a little bit in the autumn. But in the United Kingdom, it's really unique that we get tornadoes year round and there really isn't a peak seasonality for them. On average, England is hit by about 34 tornadoes each year. Just went really dark. Me and my friend had to hold on to the railing. It was that windy and it just went completely black and then just big dust storms flying around everywhere. In 2005, a tornado in Birmingham reached speeds of 200 kilometers per hour, injured 19 people, tore up more than 1,000 trees, and caused 40 million pounds worth of damage. Unbelievable. <laughs> for, for, all the years we've been, for all the years we've been on this site, the best part of 10 years, I mean, never seen anything like this at all, not since solely back in the sort of like 87. And to sort of like see where it's so focused and, and to see the trail of it, it's absolutely incredible. And I saw a table come flying across here. Yeah, you know, a picnic table, it's four legs. Across there, it's over the top there. And all the dust and debris came up, flowers, leaves, bits of tile and everything else. Like a whirlwind going round. In November 1981, no less than 105 small tornadoes touched down across a large portion of the English Midlands, setting a world record for the most number of tornadoes in a single 24-hour period. It's only a matter of time before we do get a larger one, which would be life-threatening. So if people realise, are aware that tornadoes do occur relatively common early in the, in the United Kingdom, then they can take uh, the necessary safety precautions. But in terms of overall numbers and ferocity, the United States is undoubtedly the world's tornado hotspot, with about a thousand twisters occurring each year, resulting in 80 deaths and more than 1,500 injuries annually. All 50 states have experienced twisters, but Texas, located in the American South, holds the record with an annual average of 120. A 1953 outbreak in the central city of Waco remains the most devastating twister in the state's history. While it would eventually spread to 10 additional states over the course of its three-day lifespan, 114 fatalities would occur in the city of Waco alone. The most destructive tornadoes occur in Tornado Alley, a region that includes South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, northern Texas, and eastern Colorado. In this region, the atmosphere is affected by the Rocky Mountains to the west and the Gulf of Mexico to the south. During springtime, the Rocky Mountains can funnel a strong westerly jet stream of cool, dry air across Tornado Alley. This often creates a trough of low pressure, drawing in warm, moist air from the Gulf. That gives you the perfect conditions for large, powerful thunderstorms and the strong vertical winds necessary to spawn tornadoes. Jet streams are narrow, fast-flowing currents of air around 8 to 11 kilometers above the Earth's surface, flowing from west to east at speeds of up to 320 kilometers per hour. They were first discovered during the Second World War when pilots regularly flew from America to the United Kingdom and noticed that time was being saved on flights to the UK. They are formed by temperature differences in the upper atmosphere between the cold polar air and the warm tropical air. In the US, jet streams drag cold air from the north towards the warm air from the Gulf of Mexico. As the jet stream swings further north, so does tornado activity. Tornadoes can form at virtually any moment, but occur more often in late afternoon after a daily buildup of heat. They are also more common in spring and summer. Despite popular belief, tornadoes are invisible. The reason we are able to see them can be attributed to condensed water droplets, as well as dust and debris that gets picked up as they move across land. 
The funnel of spinning air on an average tornado is about 200 meters across, although as it twists and shifts, its path of destruction will be eight times that width. Many tornadoes move across the ground at roughly 50 kilometers per hour, but may suddenly increase to speeds of over 100 kilometers per hour. Most don't travel further than 10 kilometers during their brief lifespans. But in that time, they can be astonishingly destructive. The winds in super tornadoes, the ones that cause widespread devastation and death, can reach terrifying speeds of up to 480 kilometers per hour. Nothing above ground can survive in their path. And it's that path of destruction that is used to measure, classify, and compare every tornado. And the enhanced Fujita scale is how we measure um, the strength of a tornado, and it's based on damage rather than a direct wind speed measurement. So the Fujita scale was developed in 1971 by Ted Fujita, a scientist, and he found a correlation between the wind speed and the damage caused by a tornado. Now in 2007, the National Weather Service in the United States switched the enhanced Fujita scale. So they added more structures and more information about what wind speeds could affect different structures and different building standards and practices. So they've um, kind of updated the Fujita scale with a bit more information. The base level for a tornado is an enhanced Fujita Zero or EF0 for short. Winds will be up to 137 kilometers per hour, and you will typically see light damage. The next level of severity is EF1, with winds of up to 177 kilometers per hour. The effects will be moderate. Mobile homes will be overturned or badly damaged. When you reach EF2, winds have moved up to 217 kilometers per hour. At this point, there will be considerable damage. Roofs will tear off well-constructed houses. If you reach EF3, you'll have some really brutal wind with speeds of up to 265 kilometers per hour. Expect the damage level to be severe. Entire stories of well-constructed houses will be destroyed. At the next level of EF4, you'll have ferocious winds of up to 322 kilometers per hour, resulting in cars being thrown from the ground. But the most intense tornado of all is an EF5, with wind speeds of over 322 kilometers per hour. Anywhere hit by such a calamity will suffer unimaginable damage. Strong frame houses will be swept off their foundations and entirely leveled. Objects the size of cars will become weaponized, flying through the air further than 100 meters. It was probably 15 minutes of this just steady, loud rumble, and shaking sound, uh, almost like an earthquake. And uh, once that passed, we could hear natural gas. It was just spewing out of uh, the backyard of the house we were in. The wind from an EF5 releases one billion watts of kinetic energy, equal to the electric output of a large nuclear power station. These uh, types of tornadoes only account for around 5% of the overall number, but they wreak by far the greatest proportion of damage, death, destruction, etc. So. Most of these lower end tornadoes pass without anything or much happening, so you might get some branches broken or some small trees blown down. It's these really big ones that constitute a small proportion that are responsible for much of the damage. But if we know that tornadoes are so dangerous, why can't we just build houses that are twister-proof? It's certainly possible to build structures that can withstand a tornado, but they wouldn't make very suitable homes. And even if you live in Tornado Alley, it's highly unlikely that you're going to receive a direct hit. Even in the most tornado-prone place in the world, any given square mile is only going to get hit by a twister once every 700 years. 
so it simply doesn't make sense to live in the kind of concrete bunker that could survive such a cataclysm. But when it comes to protecting your home from the peripheral damage, there are plenty of things that can be done. The most vulnerable part of a building is the roof. With that gone, not only would wind and rain easily come in, but walls would also collapse. So securing roof tiles and attaching steel ties to the rafters is essential. Another option would be creating a safe room, a room with reinforced concrete walls and no windows within the interior of the home. Protecting our homes is important. Protecting the people inside of them is paramount. While tornadoes may form in a quick manner, there are visible danger signs that one should always be on the lookout for. A dark, greenish sky, large hail, and a powerful train-like roar from the spinning air in the distance. You may notice the wind becoming mild and the air growing still. The US Meteorological Service has developed its own tools to help save lives. They use Doppler radars, satellites, weather balloons, and computer modeling to watch the skies for severe storms and suspicious tornado-like activity. Doppler radars are able to penetrate weather systems to record wind speeds and spot any areas of rotation inside thunderstorms. Before Doppler radar, the tornado warnings were based on knowing that the environmental conditions were conducive to creating a tornado or based on live reports from people who are living in the area or perhaps a police officer or emergency responder. So those were, if, if you wait to get a tornado report and then you issue a tornado warning, that's quite a reactionary warning. Now that can give you lead time. You know the next town over. If you know the direction the tornado is heading, you do have some lead time. But Doppler radar gives a bit more lead time because you can see a tornado potentially develop. So it gives a bit more lead time in that sense. If you consider that a typical thunderstorm is about 10 to 20 kilometers across, containing both upward and downward air currents, it is vitally important to be able to see what is happening inside the storm. When a tornado has been officially sighted, warnings are issued to the population. The message is stern but simple. Seek immediate shelter. Now with modern technology, the National Weather Service now has the ability to give you location-based warnings on your mobile phone. So it will pick up where you're located. They have smaller warning areas now, and you'll be able to know that there's a tornado that's closer to your area, which is really helpful for people reacting to a tornado. Knowing a tornado is going to form is one thing. Figuring out where it is headed is another matter entirely. It had been previously thought that once a twister had been formed, it would take a random path of destruction. But a study of the catastrophic 2011 tornadoes in Tuscaloosa, Alabama and Joplin, Missouri seemed to illustrate some surprising patterns. Careful analysis of aerial photos showing the trail of devastation found that tornadoes preferred going uphill and caused more destruction during their ascension. Scientists also noticed tornadoes jumping over valleys and only critically damaging the tops of surrounding hills. This has significant implications when it comes to decisions on where and how to build in areas prone to major tornado activity. If you were in a building and a tornado was occurring, you want to get to the interior space of that building and preferably in a smaller room. So if you've ever seen a house under construction, for example, you see all of the support beams in place. If you look at a bathroom in a house that's being built, there are a lot of support beams around. So that's a very sturdy place to be. You also want to be away from windows because windows quite often shatter in a tornado and debris will be flying. So you want to be protected from that. 
Um, it's helpful to be underneath the sturdy object, so in case the roof collapses, for example, you'll be protected from that. And if you can cover yourself up in anything, that would be helpful too to protect you from debris flying. Another crucial source of information for tornado patterns and behaviors are storm chasers. Each year, scientists, weather experts, and adrenaline junkies race to be in the right place at the right time when a tornado strikes. They try to guess where it is headed so they can place sensors in its path. These sensors can provide important data like wind speed, temperature, humidity, and pressure from inside the tornado. It's an incredible challenge, but it's also incredibly dangerous. I spent a year in the States, in Oklahoma, um, where I got interested in this stuff, and I got the chance to storm chase a bit. We saw some tornadoes, supercells from a distance. I'm not properly right in there. Um, I went back for a holiday a couple of years later, was staying at a friend's house and got caught up in a supercell with tornado sirens going off, tornado warning. So I spent a year there without seeing anything up close and then went back for three days and was right in the middle of one then. So that involved everything from sheltering, getting into the bathroom, putting a mattress over your head. It was quite... Um, my heart was going quite fast during those few minutes. It doesn't last long, but everything just went black. The power went out and stuff like that. Battering winds and driving rain, lightning strikes and flash floods. These are just to name a few of the horrors these daredevils will face. All in the hopes of getting themselves closer to something even more terrifying, the tornado. If you're driving in a car, you may think you can outrun a tornado because they're not going to, tornadoes don't propagate forward at 100 miles per hour. However, what a tornado can do is it can lift up from the ground and reform in another place very close by, and that place could be right in front of your car. Tornadoes can also take a sharp right hand turn without notice. They tend to wobble, they tend to not go directly in a straight line. On average, a tornado will go in a straight line, but they do wobble, and you can't predict that when you're in a car. But tornadoes are not only found on land. They can also form over oceans, lakes, and even rivers as swirling columns of air. Tornadic water spouts share features with land tornadoes. They are linked with severe thunderstorms and often coincide with large hail, powerful winds, and storm surges, as well as hazardous lightning. If a water spout moves on shore, the National Weather Service will issue a tornado warning, as some of them pose a significant danger to both life and property. But thunderstorms aren't always necessary to form a water spout. There exists a strange kind of water spout which forms along the dark, flat base of a line of developing cumulus clouds, the fair weather water spout. While tornadic water spouts develop downward in a thunderstorm, a fair weather water spout develops from an isolated patch of rapidly spinning air on the surface of the water and builds its way upwards. By the time you can see the funnel, the fair weather water spout is reaching maturity. They form in light wind conditions, which is why they remain relatively static. But moving in to take a closer look would be a grave mistake, as they can be just as deadly as a tornado. There is another cousin of the tornado that also forms in fair weather, known as the dust devil. dust devil is a strong, clearly formed whirlwind. A large dust devil can be 10 meters wide and extend more than a kilometer in height, a palpable threat to both people and property. Dust devils require certain conditions to spawn. They need clear skies and a flat, barren surface, such as desert or tarmac, to absorb heat from the sun and create the hot air that fuels them. Any wind will destabilize their spinning effect. 
when the earth is heated up such that an area of the earth is warmer than the air above it, then you have rising air. And now if that air is rotating and it gets stretched, it rotates very quickly and becomes a dust devil. Dust devils are mostly small and short-lived, but can often develop into a truly dangerous threat. But it's the fully formed tornado that is Mother Nature's true wind-driven killing machine. The worst outbreak occurred in the United States on the 3rd and 4th of April, 1974. The country saw 148 twisters across 13 states, killing 335 people and injuring upwards of 6,000. Just how deadly and destructive they can be was made tragically apparent in May of 2011, when an EF-5 tornado swept across Joplin, a town in Missouri with a population of over 50,000. By the time that twister had blown its devastating course, it had killed 158 people and injured upwards of a thousand. It was a hot and humid Sunday afternoon on the 22nd of May, 2011, in the central United States. As clouds gathered, people braced themselves for a coming summer storm. But as cold and warm fronts clashed in the skies above, a supercell thunderstorm was formed. 2011 had already been a testing year for wild weather. Throughout April, several state records were broken during a period which included a deadly outbreak of violent tornadoes across the Midwest. By the end of April, there had been a staggering 292 tornadoes, setting a new record for the total number of twisters in a single month. On the 27th of April, the first EF-5 super tornado in three years killed at least 14 people and cut a half-mile sway through entire neighborhoods in Smithville, Mississippi. This is why weather watchers became so concerned when just four weeks later, another supercell moved ominously from southern Kansas to Missouri. The National Weather Service issued a tornado watch at 2.40 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, indicating that conditions for tornadoes were favorable in parts of Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, and Oklahoma. The storm generated several twisters, as well as wind damage and flash flooding across southwestern Missouri. Late in the afternoon, storm chasers and spotters reported multiple vortices west of Joplin. The National Weather Service received its first report of the tornado at 4.34 p.m. local time from west of the Missouri-Kansas border. It intensified with unprecedented speed as it transformed from a funnel cloud to an extremely large and powerful twister in under 10 minutes. By 4.45 p.m., Jasper County Emergency Management had begun coordinating with the National Weather Service to track the tornado and issued a specific alert for Joplin at 5.17 p.m. The city of Joplin borders Arkansas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. At the time, its population was only around 50,000, but more than 400,000 people lived within a 64-kilometer radius, making Joplin Missouri's fourth largest metropolitan area. At 5.17, outdoor emergency sirens immediately sounded in Joplin. They wouldn't know it at the time, but they now had just 24 minutes to protect themselves from the monster tornado that was to destroy much of their city. When they heard the first wail of the sirens, many people looked out and saw nothing and just assumed that it was a false alarm. And the later sirens may have been drowned out by the noise of torrential rain and hail that preceded the tornado's first onslaught. It's very tempting to go outside and see what's going on. I cannot recommend against that enough. You typically do not have that much time before a tornado strikes. So if a tornado warning goes off and you're in your home, go into an interior room in your house, preferably away from windows. 
go under something sturdy just in case there's debris falling on you and if you can wrap yourself up to prevent being damaged by the debris that's flying around you, then that's ideal. As the storm tore through entire neighborhoods, emergency services collapsed. Two of the four fire stations in the city were swept away by the strong winds. The local hospital was being torn apart. All police, fire, and ambulance personnel were given instructions not to venture out until the storm had passed. If you're out in the open, there is no building you can take shelter in. Get out of your vehicle. If you are in a vehicle, a vehicle is not a safe place to be in a tornado. Find the lowest place around you, such as a ditch, and get flat, as flat as possible. Try to cover up your head and neck to prevent being injured by debris. Don't go under an overpass. So it's quite tempting to try to hide underneath an overpass because you won't be affected by the hail. But it's been found that the winds in a tornado as they pass over an overpass can create a wind tunneling effect, which can actually create wind speeds that are higher than actually within the tornado itself. Ranked as an EF5, the highest possible classification, it was estimated that the tornado's maximum wind speed clocked in at more than 320 kilometers per hour. The tornado sliced through over nine kilometers of Joplin from west to east, cutting a swathe of destruction and death over a kilometer wide. It caused 161 fatalities and 1,371 injuries, making it the single deadliest U.S. tornado since 1947 and the seventh deadliest in U.S. history. At the height of its ferocity, it crushed homes and wrenched them from their foundations. Steel reinforced concrete porches were torn apart and hurled through the air. Concrete driveways lifted off the soil beneath them Family cars were launched through houses or rolled and spun until they were completely crushed. More than 15,000 vehicles, including heavy buses and tractor trailers, were picked up and carried by winds, some for hundreds of meters. Thousands of buildings were destroyed and damaged. Wood-framed houses turned into kindling, and paving stones were tossed through the air like confetti. Shocked survivors rummaged amongst the debris of what only a few minutes ago had been their family homes, searching for their possessions. They knew that for them, this was day zero. They would have to start their lives again from scratch. People were seen walking around in a daze. They couldn't even tell where they were. Everything they had known, every street sign, every building, every landmark was gone. In its place, a flat sea of debris. The loss of life could well have been higher. At the time the tornado struck, Joplin High School was holding its graduation ceremony at the nearby Missouri Southern State University, which fortunately did not suffer significant damage. The Joplin High School building, however, suffered a direct hit. The Joplin tornado destroyed 4,380 homes and damaged an additional 3,884. It tore structures off their foundations leaving only anchor bolts on the ground. Even buildings with precast concrete walls suffered partial or complete collapse. The area affected by the tornado was comprised of almost 30% of the city and generated some 2.3 million cubic meters of debris. The tornado also caused serious damage to several healthcare facilities. In the case of St. John's Regional Medical Center, along with significant structural damage, five patients and one visitor tragically died. The hospital's emergency helicopter was also completely destroyed. You're talking on the orders of maybe tens of minutes to half an hour or something. You want people to be there as quickly as possible, but 
Obviously you have these mitigating factors, you've got trees down, you've got houses, so you've got this scene of devastation that you have to navigate your way through. So it's not just a simple question of getting the right people to the injured and um, worse than that on time. Um, it's the fact that oftentimes can't get there as quickly as they'd like to and this helps or this pushes the number up um, a lot further in time in the, the hours or so after the event. After the tornado passed, ambulances and crews arrived quickly at the scene. Emergency responders from areas all around southwest Missouri were summoned to report to a command post at 34th and Main to help deal with the damage and destruction. In the immediate aftermath of the tornado, members of the public, many of whom had just seen their own homes destroyed, searched through the debris for survivors. Many of the paramedics answering calls found it virtually impossible to recognize streets, which had once been very familiar. Fires caused by gas leaks lit up the night sky. It was like a war zone. Hundreds of electricity transmission poles had fallen, forcing much of the devastated city to endure the tornado's aftermath without power. Phone communications in and out of Joplin were largely cut off. Downed trees and power lines added to the debris blocking many streets in Joplin, making them impassable for the emergency services. Clearing those became a priority, and the fire service called for extra heavy equipment and front loaders to help shift the debris. As the roads freed up, the movement of emergency vehicles throughout the city gradually improved. Extra police were called up to help with security. Highway patrol troopers moved swiftly to become a visible presence, both to reassure shaken survivors and to prevent opportunistic crime. Some 9,000 people were displaced. The extreme destruction forced thousands of residents to seek refuge with family or friends. The American Red Cross established a shelter at the Missouri Southern State University for some 300 residents made homeless by the tornado. The university served as the base for many first responders. Some of the city's undamaged school buildings were also opened as shelters for the displaced. That Sunday night, Governor Jay Nixon declared a state of emergency and announced the deployment of the National Guard in response to the deadly disaster. Not much more than 12 hours after the tornado touched down, nearly 500 firefighters, public works personnel, and other municipal employees volunteered for duty. Teams of searchers fanned out across several square miles of smoking wasteland. They went house to house, plot to plot, checking for survivors, listening out for anyone who might have been trapped under their fallen homes. If they came upon a room that was still standing, they marked the wall outside as they went in to search and crossed the mark to show that it was all clear. Collapsed buildings, which had been thoroughly searched, were marked in a highly visible red paint. Even wrecked cars were marked. Everywhere it was conceivable that a person could have been trapped was marked with a cross if it was all clear, or a V if it contained a victim. Specialized emergency response teams, including Missouri's disaster medical assistance team, were sent to provide aid and assistance to the tornado-stricken town. In the days following the catastrophe, the official government effort was geared towards search and rescue as opposed to cleaning up. So the tornado's 10-kilometer path still resembled a war zone. In all, 17 people were pulled alive from the contorted remains of homes, shops, and offices. Rescuers continued to sift through the debris, desperately searching for survivors, but more often than not, finding only corpses. 
Four days after the disaster, 125 bodies had been recovered. Considering that 232 people were still unaccounted for, they expected the grim toll to rise. EF5, or the highest level of tornadoes, constitute about one in a thousand of all storms, and this was the level of the Joplin tornado. So even though in the US they get these really intense and violent storms a lot, seemingly, it's still relatively rare for any one location to receive or to be impacted by one of these. So the National Weather Service went back, um, did a particular assessment of this event to try and work out why? So they gave their warnings on time, people were warned, but assessment of the event and the aftermath was that because this was such a rare and exceptional event, despite the warnings, people were a bit blasé about reacting straight away. And this is something that probably contributed to the death toll being as high as it was. There were many personal tragedies. A 16-month-old boy had been pulled from his mother's arms when the tornado ripped her home apart. The search for the missing child had been followed on news items and social media across the nation. But hopes were dashed when his body was found buried amongst the rubble. Those on the front lines in Joplin continued treating the injured and searching for bodies all the while facing the psychological challenges of dealing with devastation most of them had never even imagined. When it became clear that there were no more bodies to recover, four joint task forces were set up to manage the largest recovery priorities, housing, schools, critical infrastructure, and debris removal. They coordinated the disposal of hazardous household wastes from the tornado's impact zone, as well as conducting air monitoring for the presence of asbestos and other dangerous dust matter. Debris was spread far beyond the city limits of Joplin. An open Facebook group was set up for people finding debris away from the Joplin area to help send back items of personal importance to people who may well have lost everything in the tornado. We know how hard it was, and we know what a long road of recovery it's going to be for them. But we know that there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. One week after the storm, President Obama visited the city to see the damage for himself. At a memorial service, he let the people of Joplin know they were not alone. Their tragedy was a national tragedy, and everything possible was going to be done to help continue with the rescue and recovery effort. Uh, this has been such a devastating and traumatic experience for all of us in Joplin, and people have reached out to us from all over the world, and it has helped us become a better community, and the response that people have given to Joplin helps us see the, the hope for the future of Joplin. Following the president's visit, the Federal Emergency Management Agency established 15 temporary housing sites throughout the area. At its peak, it was home to 586 families and households. Through the first year of recovery, the agency provided nearly $21 million in grants to help victims pay for home repairs, temporary housing, and other critical disaster-related needs. In the aftermath of the disaster, it was estimated that more than 140,000 registered volunteers provided nearly 900,000 hours of service. AmeriCorps, a voluntary civil society program supported by both public and private donations, also made a long-term commitment to the recovery efforts. In the year following the disaster, more than 350 AmeriCorps members from across the United States served in Joplin, aiding homeowners and coordinating donations. The tornado that brought chaos and death to Joplin surpassed the 8th of June 1953 tornado that claimed 116 lives in Flint, Michigan, making it the deadliest single tornado to strike the US since modern record keeping began in 1950. There has been a decline in the number of tornado-related deaths in the United States over the past century. 
I think the reason for this could be because people know more about tornadoes, we're more aware of them, we're more aware of what to do, and also because the National Weather Service has an early warning system in place. So the average lead time for a tornado is 13 minutes, and that gives people enough time to take shelter. On the fifth anniversary of the disaster, the city organized Joplin Proud four days of events to recognize an unforgettable date in their history. Guest speakers shared what the city had learned from the storm. A marathon, a kid's run, and a walk of silence were held to commemorate the tragedy and to celebrate the regeneration and rebuilding of their town. A permanent memorial was laid out with a plaque listing the names of all the lives lost. It also contains an illustration detailing the path of the tornado as well as the haunting outlines of two houses that had once stood in its place. It's not just that you need to be able to accurately forecast the tornado, it's that you need to make sure that the public are responding to those warnings in the way that you want them to. And this is a more challenging thing because that draws in aspects of social science as well. It's not just you have your equations and you work them out in the atmosphere and that's fine. It involves more of a cross-disciplinary approach to science and that's something that is not always as easy to get right. So oftentimes groups may be focused on their particular area and then interacting with these other um, scientific groups is doesn't always come naturally to people. So that, I think, is probably the biggest challenge, probably on a par with the actual science as what, of what is going on inside the storm. Cunningham Park, which had been destroyed and rebuilt in the wake of the tornado, was dedicated to the volunteers. A robust metallic plaque was constructed to honor all those who offered themselves to the Joplin effort without request serving as a reminder of the overwhelming power of human generosity. It was named the miracle of the human spirit. We're now at a point where you can have really, really detailed simulations of tornadoes. This was unimaginable, say, 50 or so years ago. We're talking several orders of magnitude smaller now. But it still won't be perfect, because any time you have storms or what's known as convection, you have a kind of random element to it. So it's never, there's always gonna be some secrets that the atmosphere will keep, basically. But generally, we're much closer to being able to predict the degree of intensification of tornadoes and the timing of intensification of tornadoes. And these are the most important things for people on the ground. Joplin residents share a deeply held desire not to forget the tragedies that befell them during that fateful May in 2011. They and all those who came to their aid are a testament to the strength of the human spirit when faced with the brutal side of Mother Nature. Their story is yet another reminder of the deadly disasters that continue to threaten our homes and our lives.